Hello and welcome everyone. Um, so this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. We'll start in about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Grant, you're one of the speakers. Why don't you introduce yourself? Please? Yeah, sure. My name is Grant Vogel. Um, I'm with the standards team in Pegasus, which is a part of the consensus. And i um, been working with them for now for about a year. And also a present tomorrow. a year tomorrow. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, also, I'll be presenting with uh, my partner, also working in the standards team at Pegasus, uh, Rob Coot. Yeah, Rob, Rob, please introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Rob Coot. I've been with Consensus for a year as well, working on the standards team, uh, developing contributions uh, uh, with the, uh, the Consensus wider, wider group uh, to the Enterprise Student Alliance. Okay, and so we'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, see you then. Look forward to it.
Um, we are going to lead off today and we're going to talk about um, the Enterprise Ethereum client specification and I guess no one better can introduce it than Grant and Rob, so Grant, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Grant Noble and along with my partner Rob Koot, uh, we will be uh, presenting the um, Enterprise Ethereum client specification. Now, I realize that this was uh, actually published uh, to be the version 2 of the specification, but we certainly wanted to give you a little bit more background, a little bit more about uh, version 1 of the specification, um, some of the thinking that went into that, as well as some um, additional information about the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which is the group that was um, uh, specifically tasked with putting this uh, specification together. So without further ado, um, just give you an overview of what our presentation will be today. Um, as I said, I'd like to give you an overview of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance itself, what its mandate is, and a little bit of what they're about. Give you a recap of the Enterprise Ethereum client specification version one. What were some of the main features, some of the main points in that specification? One of which was the Enterprise Ethereum client architecture stack. And we'll talk fairly um, uh, in depth about the architecture stack. I'll then hand over to Rob. Rob will um, give you an overview of the Enterprise Ethereum client specification version 2. And I promise I'm going to quit saying Enterprise Ethereum client specification because that's just quite a mouthful. So Rob is going to give you an overview of version 2 of the specification. Um, mostly um, a delta, if you like, from version 1 to version 2. It'll come back to me. I'll look at some of the future um, features for the client specification version 3. And then we'll finish off with some questions. Having said that, though, um, let's try and make this presentation as, um, as open and interactive as possible. So if you've got any questions along the way, please feel free to just raise your hand and let's have a chat. Um, don't necessarily guarantee that we might be able to answer those questions, um, but we'll certainly give it our best shot. All right. So let's kick off. First of all, the, one th the first thing that we really want to do is, is talk about what is, what do we mean by enterprise Ethereum? Well, when we were working to help develop the version one of the specification, one of the things that was really important to us was that the public Ethereum be the core of what we mean by enterprise Ethereum. So using public Ethereum as the core, um, enterprise Ethereum then are the extensions to public Ethereum to provide the sorts of things that, that enterprises and businesses are really interested in. Um, things like private transactions, permissioning, uh, performance, and, and various enterprise management type features. So that's really the baseline of where we're coming from. So now, a little bit about the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, or EEA itself. It's an alliance of companies worldwide, approximately 450 members, um, comprising of com you know, tech big technology companies like Microsoft, Intel, Hewlett Packard, plus a whole range of smaller companies in the blockchain ecosystem. Um, as well as a number of financial institutions like J.P. Morgan Chase in the United States and Banco Santander in Europe. Um, a global standards organization and their whole mandate, I suppose, is really to develop um, a series of open standards-based architecture and specifications for enterprise theory. So with that in mind, uh, in May of 2018, May of this year, uh, version one of the specification was announced in uh, New York at Blockchain Week. And then just very recently, last month, yes, it, it was last month, <laughs> um, version two of the specification 
was announced at the DEF CON 4 um, conference in Prague. So how do we, how do all these member organizations, you know, this Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and all its member organizations, how do they sort of fit together and how do they work together to develop this specification document that we have? Well, certainly we have, uh, within the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, we have a number of working groups of which Consensus is part of. Um, within Consensus, both Rob and myself work in the standards team and we liaise very closely with our developers, our product managers, um, our research um, arm of the company to develop and, and to come up with the, the ideas and, the, and the, the requirements and the contributions that we wish to make into the actual specification itself. And likewise, other organizations are doing the same and then that information feeds back to us, which we then feed back to our product development teams um, who are developing our products. And so it all works together to come up with this, the final product, which is the actual specification document itself. So without further ado, let's talk about the specification version one that was announced in May of this year talk about a few of the main points. Um, one of the main features that came out of the version 1 specification was a definition of an enterprise Ethereum architecture stack. Now, the reasoning behind putting this architecture stack together was really to provide some, a degree of familiarity, if you like, um, for people who might be familiar with, say, a network architecture stack. So it gives them a point of reference when they're looking into or investigating uh, the enterprise Ethereum. It gives them um, um, something, something that is familiar to them. And basically this architecture stack is a library of interfaces between the different components that we believe make up enterprise Ethereum. Uh, it's ex um, other points in version one of the specification were some extensions to the JSON RPC API in order to cater for things like private transactions, of which we define a couple of different types of private transactions depending on different privacy transactions, uh, different privacy requirements, I should say. You guys accept, uh, did you accept different models of uh, authentication and authorization, or was it essentially, are you essentially baking in a, some sort of a single point of authorization for a given implementation? Yeah, no. Um, uh, with, with version one of the specification, and indeed with version two, um, there are different um, methods of authentication, if you like, different um, I think Rob will, will, will talk a little bit more detail about authentication, um, but yeah, certainly there will be. Yeah, I, I think I think your question will be answered in a bit more detail a little bit further on in the presentation. Cool. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. So, next thing I'd like to talk about then is this thing that we call the client architecture stack. And there you have the client architecture stack. A couple of points I just want to make um, up front about this. Uh, you'll see a number of different um, yellow and green and purple and blue colored boxes. What does it all mean? Effectively, the yellow and green boxes represent what is now with public Ethereum. Right? So that's, again, as I was saying, that's the core of public Ethereum. The boxes on the right hand side, the, the purple or lilac colored boxes, um, they are the, the features, if you like, um, for an enterprise Ethereum implementation. Okay, these are the sorts of features that we would like to see in an enterprise Ethereum implementation. And the boxes at the top of the diagram represent the applications. They're the, the applications, the smart contracts and things that are all built upon or on top of an enterprise Ethereum 
the heat tension. Right. So let's go through this stack diagram sort of one layer at a time. The first layer, starting from the bottom, working our way up. The first layer is the network layer. This is where all of the network protocols live. So we've got the on a public side, we've got div P2P uh, being the main protocol for communication between Ethereum nodes. Um, and then as you know, over time, as new protocols perhaps are developed, they'll be incorporated into the enterprise Ethereum. Now, even though we have a, a strict delineation in this diagram, we don't necessarily want to say this is public and this is enterprise. All right? Things will migrate and things will coexist over time. So things that are developed, for example, in an enterprise type scheme might well be migrated into the public over time. And vice versa, things that are developed in the public Ethereum might well be useful in an enterprise scheme. So from that point of view, you know, don't see it as a hard and fast division between the two, but from a diagrammatic representation, it's convenient to do it that way. I've got a question. Sure. In Ethereum 2, um, the, the, kind of, there's plans to use lib P2P. Mm -hmm. How does that, you know, like essentially Ethereum moving forward and changing, say, deprecating dev P2P, how mm -hmm. does that interrelate with the entire spec? Well, that's, and, and that's exactly what I was trying to refer to. Yeah. As these new protocols are developed in the public sphere, they may well be the de facto standard, if you like, mm -hmm. um, in, in any type of um, Ethereum uh, network, whether it be public or enterprise. Mm -hmm. So as these things are developed, they will be incorporated into subsequent versions of the specification. Okay. So if I could just add that um, yep. enterprise Ethereum is about extensions, enterprise extensions to public Ethereum. So as public Ethereum is enhanced and, and new technologies come, uh, come available, mm. enterprise Ethereum clients would like to embrace those and make them part of their Version of one of our version, I should say, on the protocol. So are they expecting to be sort of, um, are they expecting to use sort of say the uh, IP stack concept where you have the old version, you have the new version, you may have stack that handles both, but they're completely separate, or are you expecting to have a lot more on the model of other ones where you have a single, single stack that supports these extensions, and if it gets something that's got more than that, it either just reads what it, it knows and deals with it, it ignores the rest, or is that part of the specification how you deal with uh, protocol version and mismatches essentially? Yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good question, and uh, that level of detail is not included in the specification okay. at the moment, but it's certainly an area which we need to consider if we're moving to different versions of the stacks and different protocols, etc. And, and that would need to be that migration model that needs to be uh, considered in the future. Okay. Okay. And I, I suspect something like that, where um, a new protocol were introduced. I suspect that maybe over time, over a, a couple of versions of, of specifications, the two might be considered, whereas one is the standard, whereas the other becomes deprecated right. over well, time. And I, then, I guess the, the question kind of boils back to kind of, I, I guess, a, a philosophy, which is why I would say my is, do we want to build a system that allows, essentially for flag things, is you have to be able to say, at this version of the protocol, you can't expect the old client to understand it at all. We have to build a new one. Or should we always accept the idea that a client should be able to parse as much as it possibly can? Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. you know, so are the flag are yeah. not in your in your protocol. Yeah, so like sunset closing of certain yeah. possible protocols. Exactly. Yeah, we could certainly put that in the future, and that's a very. Good I, I, that's more of a design philosophy, which yeah. is why I would say this is something that I want to work with. No flag days or flag days are acceptable. Okay. So moving forward, one layer up the stack, uh, the core blockchain layer. Um, again, we've divided this into a series of sublayers. The first sublayer is the storage ledger sublayer. Um, this is where your on-chain, off-chain uh, storage uh, for the blockchain resides. Um, in addition to the, um, the, the state 
of the blockchain, both on-chain, off-chain. Following on from that, the execution sublayer, that's your EDM. So that's your execution of your smart contracts, uh, pre-compiled contracts um, in the public side. On the enterprise side, what we're looking at including is um, requirements in the specification around things like trusted execution environments <coughs> for operations on isolated hardware environments, you know, isolated chipsets and, and so on and so forth. Taking you know, transactions off the blockchain, operating them outside. And then finally in this in this layer we've got the consensus sublayer. Um, proof of work, proof of stake in the public side, and then looking at some degree of uh, private consensus mechanisms, um, such as IBFT, any of the others, as they are developed. The next layer, privacy and scaling layer, uh, the first sub-layer within that is the privacy sub-layer. This is where we have, in the public side, we've got your different uh, cryptographic privacy techniques, things like ZK SNARKs, and um, on the enterprise side, looking at uh, your, your private transactions existing beside the public transactions, as well as some off-chain uh, transaction processing uh, in these trusted execution environments that we talked about previously. We also have uh, a series of requirements in the specification about the scaling. So we have a scaling sublayer. Um, this is where we, you know, initiatives like plasma and sharding and other types of parallelization techniques um, that would be developed over time in order to increase performance. Uh, the next layer we have is, is the tooling layer. So the, uh, I divided up into a series of sublayers. The first being the permissions and credentials sublayer. On the public side, these are your, uh, your key management, your wallets. On the enterprise side, we're looking at including requirements about hardware security modules, okay, and a whole other system of permissioning um, for uh, permissioning uh, and authentication. For example, using smart contracts. Rob will be giving, a, a, as part of this presentation, we'll be talking a lot more about that a little bit later. Uh, we also have the integration and deployment tools sublayer. So these are your um, different libraries that allow you to implement your APIs using different language bindings. Okay, And then on the enterprise side, um, looking at some of the different uh, enterprise management systems that allow people for, uh, allow organizations to um, uh, configuration and deployment management systems, for example, uh, performance management systems, uh, statistical analysis uh, on the blockchain, those sorts of things. And then finally at the bottom of this layer, we've got the client interfaces, APIs, layer, sub-layer. This is your JSON RPC API. Uh, used for communication uh, with the client, as well as interfaces for communication between clients, or between chains, I should say. Um, on the enterprise side, we're looking at including requirements in the specification about trusted oracles, so that we can get into the blockchain uh, secure, real-world type information. And then finally, right at the top, we've got the application library. So your DApp sublayer, these are your decentralized applications running on top of Ethereum. Um, also at this layer, we have various tools that are used to monitor the blockchain. The uh, infrastructure contracts and standards sublayer, um, your uh, different standards for performing identity verification, and again, Rob is going to talk a little bit about using some smart contracts for permissioning and authentication. And then finally, the, sub, the smart contract tools sublayer, uh, which are your, your, your smart contract languages and your various verification tools. Okay. Any questions on what I've presented so far? 
So if there's no further no questions for me, I'm going to hand over to Rob, and Rob will give you an overview of the version two of the specification. Great, thanks, Greg. Thank you. <clears throat> so, yep, as Greg mentioned, I'm going to talk about the changes in the version two uh, EDA client specification. Give an overview of those. Just in my uh, interest, can I get a show of hands who's actually downloaded and, and read the version two of the specification? Actual audience we want to divide up downloaded well, versus read. Well, <laughs> well done. So I think there was about. Yeah. Yes, okay, show of hands, please. Who, who's done it? Who's read it? Okay, so shall I tell you the percentage? That's about three out of 17. So there's a bit of homework for you guys. Um, okay, so I guess um, we took a look at where we're at at the end of version one and where, how we got there. And we it became apparent that there was two main focus areas. Uh, which were for version two. And the first of those was uh, changes to the processes and procedures um, to allow for scaling, uh, the number of uh, collaborators, efficient, uh, efficient scaling. And second was, of course, just ongoing continued improvements to the content of the specification. So talking more about the first of those, um, a major revamp was uh, conducted uh, on the processes and procedures uh, in version one. Uh, we had a, a OneDrive document sharing approach where we were having the Microsoft Word uh, version of the specification shared across multiple collaborators around the world. Um, that worked relatively well for the number of people involved at that time, but as that number grew, having you know, 10, 15 comments on one line of a Word document with the, with the comment bubbles, it just became unmanageable. So we moved to a more sophisticated uh, GitHub-based collaboration process for version two and beyond. Um, how that works is members can contribute uh, by raising GitHub issues and pull requests. The uh, members will review those um, uh, pull requests and discuss them. Uh, and if there's no objections, they will be merged into the specification. A key part of this uh, is also knowledge transfer. There's 269 registered members of the uh, this how to use it. it was very important. So we took the time to ensure that documentation was available. Uh, people were available to, to tra train people um, to, to, uh, so they could get very good understanding as quickly as possible for the new processes and procedures. So that worked pretty well. Um, and we, the good news is we now have processes wow. enabling a much more efficient, um, higher level of uh, collaboration uh, in the DEA, in the TSWG. Resulting from the above changes, uh, we actually had to change the document type, uh, format, and, and tools. Um, uh, we went from a, a Microsoft Word document, as I mentioned, uh, to a text-based markdown format suitable for use with the GitHub uh, revision control system. Uh, unfortunately, markdown doesn't support uh, those nice features like you know, auto-generating auto table, uh, sorry, heading numbers and things like that. So we've actually used a respec tool, originally authored and uh, created by W3C, uh, and we use that now for auto-generating the, uh, uh, the, the, the heading numbering, some terminology linking, and other things like table contents linking as well. Uh, the document uh, now has all the requirements labeled uh, with a unique identifier, uh, such as PART 010. Uh, this allows for uh, easier referencing individual requirements from external documents or academic papers. The requirements uh, now have also been categorized for easier identification uh, across different categories, protocol, client, and external, for example. So, so that, was the, uh, that was the process and procedure changes and the format changes that took up a lot of work during the version two timeframe. So what's left here in content changes? Um, this is what we focused on, what's the process and procedures we're, we're, we're right now. So uh, a security consideration section was added at the beginning of the document. This just uh, outlines some compliance security aspects which um, uh, implementers are, are recommended to, um, to consider as part of building the clients. The permissions and credentials section in the document was refined and improved, uh, particularly the terms and de definitions around a fear and account participant and enterprise participant were uh, improved. To, uh, to increase the, I guess, understandability of the, 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 the requirements in that section. There was a considerable number of updates to the JSON up C API uh, in version two. The, there was discussions amongst members about how to handle extensions to the core Ethereum, public Ethereum uh, RPC API calls. Uh, and it was decided that, um, uh, that for any enterprise extensions, new functions would be uh, 
um, would be uh, provided, and um, that so, so we wouldn't go down the path of uh, using additional optional parameters on the public Ethereum methods. New methods would be uh, uh, would be actually introduced for the enterprise extensions. So to uh, to along with that, uh, it was decided that those new enterprise extensions would occupy an EEA namespace with an EEA underscore prefix. So all of those extension functions as methods would have the EEA underscore prefix. Uh, accordingly, the uh, send transaction async function, which was in version one, uh, it uh, no longer required the restriction of parameters that have to be a default because uh, we now move to a, to a separate namespace. So that's been changed. Uh, the callback has been, has been changed for this function as well in version 2 to include far uh, greater amount of data, including the TX hash, so this allows more efficiency uh, for the usability. New methods have been added, uh, including the client capabilities call in version 2. This uh, allows more information from the client to be, to be obtained, such as what restriction levels it uh, supports. Uh, additionally, the synchronous version of the send transaction call uh, was added in version 2 to the specification, uh, along with um, methods being specified which are required for core compatibility, so compatibility with core public material. Is, is there uh, going to be a requirement or a possibility that anything in the EEA namespace will call something in the public namespace? In other words, you can have a dependency between the two versions of the EEA version. So in a function that's EEA underscore something or other, can it call a function that is in the public? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, okay. well, that's you, you then tie you then tie them together. Yes. So, yes. so wouldn't you <coughs> in that case so isn't that an applicant internal to the application? You know, so you've got an enterprise Ethereum client, hmm. and if they want to make a simple, you know, like there's some EEA function and to implement it, they internally call a public Ethereum function. It, like it, it, it is to a certain extent an implementer's decision, but it's also a specification of a should you ever be allowed to do this or should you not be allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't believe there's anything currently which prohibits that. Okay, so because if you don't, then that by default prick you allow it. So you tie the two together. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, that way. Yep. Question at the back, Rob. Uh, sorry, not a question, comment, observation, I guess, but the the EA namespace already includes a bunch of software and sending transactions and sending the private transactions, which are very similar to the public sending transactions of the mirrors of, mm. of the, the methods. And so there's already, I guess, some of that idea that the EA uh, methods are going to be sometimes very similar to the, the core standard of mirrors. So, yep. So when you're implementing this, you have to make a decision as to whether you're doing the, uh, the public theory or enterprise theory, or can you just start using public and then call enterprise? Okay. Theory. So to answer that, the enterprise, the Ethereum Foundation, uh, I guess, defines a set of uh, a set of public Ethereum um, API functions, which um, uh, which uh, go along with each version of the public, public Ethereum. What we're defining here is extensions beyond that, which are, um, are for enterprise usage. So if you were just wanting to implement a, a public Ethereum client, you would probably just uh, implement the, the public Ethereum interface. If you want to align yourself with the enterprise Ethereum alliance specification, you would have to implement these additional extensions, uh, these new functions as well, uh, to, to be compliant with that specification. And they're really usable. Like you don't have to buy them. No, no, no. The specification is going to be publicly available and, and you can uh, implement those yourself. The public specification only specifies the you know the, 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 uh, the function itself, it doesn't provide implementations at this time at least. So it may do Yeah. I just want to explain so thank you that question. But if I suspect that a client developer or client provider may want to make a licensing decision or something like that, we literally be able to implement to decide whether or not if you were to, you know, start using their client and they want they say, well we need EA client, we need to get a license to use the EA methods, for example. Yeah. Yeah. That that's really up to implementation, yeah. not up to specification. Yeah. Yep. So right. that's that's a great point. Uh, thanks for having me. So continuing with the content changes in version two, uh, we've added a new experimental section uh, for network permissioning uh, using smart contracts. Uh, we'll talk more in detail about these uh, shortly. 
Um, also, whitelisting as of Ethereum accounts has been added to control uh, which accounts can submit transactions uh, in the network. Uh, Finer grain permissioning for participants, um, uh, the different transaction types which they may, may submit has been also added, uh, including deploying smart contract, uh, calling functions, uh, the change to state of the smart contract, and value transfers. The performance section, uh, the requirements there have been removed in version 2. Uh, the intention here is to uh, rework that considerably going forward, uh, potentially uh, in a separate document even um, to, the, to the main specification. The consensus uh, section has also been considerably reworked in version 2. Uh, I just wanted to note here that the IBFT, requiring IBFT support, has been removed in this version. Cross-client compatibility requirements also significantly revised, um, and also we've, uh, the, the, the specification now requires implementing the pre-compiled contracts defined in the yellow paper, uh, along with an Ethereum gas mechanism, and the gas price can be zero if the implementer chooses. The um, last thing to mention here, the support for Whisper protocol was, um, uh, was added as a requirement in this version. So I want to just uh, overview the, the, the new network permissioning smart contracts that have been added. Uh, four fundamental in interfaces for these have been added in the version two of the specification. So I'll just walk through this so you can understand how it works. Um, the, there's a participant uh, contract, there's a participant group contract, a network contract, and a permissioning decider. Uh, the, how the model works is uh, a network is a collection of enterprises uh, which um, wish to interact with the blockchain. Each enterprise is represented as a participant group with an accompanying list of uh, participants and also client nodes uh, which belong to that enterprise. There is a trust model um, in, in as well and participants can endorse other participants, hence building a trust model which can be traversed uh, to, which is useful for enterprises when they are making the decision whether to vote for a new enterprise to be joining the network. So a new enterprise uh, in this model can only join the network after being invited by uh, the existing members. <coughs> and how that generally works, sorry, actually. What's the difference between a participant and a node? So could you say that again, please? The difference between a participant and a node? Uh, okay, participant represents a person, a human. Uh, okay. So the human <coughs> could have an account or a Yes. So is a participant account. an Ethereum account? One and the same, pretty much one and the same. Okay, yep. so it's not, a, and so an enterprise can have one or more Ethereum accounts, which are participants, yep. and they can have one or more nodes. Correct, correct. Makes sense? Yeah. And a participant. They have people, they have people, and they have nodes. So is a participant... So are you talking about agent? As in a, an agent is in both a class, but maybe a software agent, a person, or a group buying company? We are talking about a concept. Uh, participant is, a, uh, is a, an entity uh, which uh, re is represented by an Ethereum account is associated with a participant and that represents a human in this, in this, in this model. So if there's a participant group, and that's obviously a, a group of, um, of people who operate accounts in a particular company, but that doesn't relate, so the nodes are separate to the participant group. Okay. Yeah. So sure. just recapping, enterprise consists of a um, participant group, which consists of participants, you know, people in the enterprise, and also nodes, which are the enterprise wants to have joined the blockchain network. Is a participant group, is it, say if you've got two enterprises, do they each have a participant group? Or yes. Okay. Yes. And is the network then, is, does each organised enterprise have a network, or is the network shared of nodes shared between the two enterprises? There is one, effectively one network contract okay. for that, for each network, for the network. Okay. Can you vote for, uh, it's actually, uh, who, gets, who gets to decide whether, who's trustworthy? Obviously at the participant level, you know, the people who are in the network vote for the new participants. Yep, I was getting to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like how you drop it. Enthusiasm. It's like a drink of water. Actually, you know, I, we, we should let you do the next slide. You vote for participants, you vote for enterprises. 
I can uh, see there'll be a lot of people reading this specification later. <laughs> <laughs> this well, is correct. I mean, the, cool, the great thing about this section is it's experimental, so we can all say, ah, it's all wrong, and then contribute to version 3. Yes, absolutely correct. Right. All right. So uh, I think I mentioned uh, a new enterprise can only join the existing network after it's invited by the existing members of the network. How does that happen? Um, when a new enterprise wants to join, a member of, a member kicks off the process. Uh, that a, a member which trusts the new um, enterprise kicks off the process by sending the invite um, call. Other members register for the event. Um, they pick up the invite event and they can use the trust model, they can use other mechanisms available to them to determine whether or not they wish to vote for or against that new enterprise joining the enterprise blockchain network. A, def a decider function exists, uh, which is changeable, and that determines the outcome of that uh, voting. Uh, it depends on the algorithm in use. So for example, it could be a majority vote algorithm. So once the, the voting's done, and the decision's been made, if it's a majority vote, for example, a new enterprise is allowed to join, um, the participants uh, from that enterprise can actually register uh, the, the nodes of that new enterprise uh, on the network, and then the existing nodes on the network will allow those new enterprise nodes to connect. Hence, we have a permissioning, a network permissioning model for the nodes. Uh, Peter did mention that this is experimental, that is true. Um, the intention there is that uh, uh, we hope that other vendors will implement this uh, uh, over, over in the not-too-distant future. Uh, there will be improvements and changes to, 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 to this model, and then eventually, if, if it's great, it gets wider acceptance, it will convert over to uh, a normative section of the document. Future work, uh, also, I want to mention uh, just around the, the concept of network instantiation and bootstrapping, how that's done. Um, that's something we'll look at in the future versions as well. Um, yes? Um, I'm new to Ethereum, but uh, is the participant entity from the previous slide interchangeable with members there? So existing participants can, what is the rest of that sentence was? Or okay. is it two different concepts? It's okay if it is, and I can look at it later. Yeah, okay. Um, a member in this case uh, is, what I was thinking, a member there is a member of the network, yeah. and in that case it's an enterprise. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, which is effectively represented by a participant group. Yeah. So it's a group of nodes and members. A member can have a group of nodes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so I'm just trying to think. You've got an enterprise which has got a participant group which has participants, yeah. and then you've got uh, a enterprise has got was it, a member which has got nodes. Oh, I'm just trying to you know like, get a bit. Does an enterprise have a member, or is an enterprise a member? Yes. My understanding. Members apply, I guess member applies at multiple levels here, doesn't it? There's participants which are members of a participant group and nodes which are members of a group. Alright, alright, so if we're using members with a low, lowercase n as in just, just a word yeah, yeah, yeah. so the process of a special group. That's, that's right, no, I agile. A lot of reading tonight. Perhaps <laughs> a, a little bit tighter definition of member. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any further questions for me before we hand back over to Grant? Okay. Grant's right. going to talk about the Version three specification. Yes. So uh, version three. What what are the things that we're planning for version three? Uh, first of all, I'd just like to preface this section of the presentation that this is all subject to change. So um, it, we've only really just started working on it. So these are just some of the things that uh, we're thinking will be included in version three. Um, timeline for version three, and, and so forth. So. Don't don't hold me to anything. Uh, I'll deny it. He hasn't checked his email yet. <laughs> so, what are the indeed? What are the plans for uh, version three of the specification? Well, first of all, we're looking at looking at scheduling version three around the May or June 2019 timeframe. Okay. Um, generally, uh, we have uh, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance has liked to announce uh, the version of a new version of a specification in conjunction with some sort of event. So depending on whether there's an event in the May or June time frame, that's when it will be likely announced. Um, another thing that we're looking at, uh, enhancements to existing requirements to ensure that they are testable. 
one of the things that we are looking to do, obviously, is we want to have some sort of certification program. In order to have a certification program, we need to have requirements that are indeed testable, measurable. Right? So these are some of the things that we're thinking about for version 3. Um, additionally, one of the side projects that's happening at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance at the moment is um, working on a specification for this off-chain trusted computing. Okay, we were trying to incorporate it into version two of the specification, but it all kind of got a little bit too hard, and the, the, the information really wasn't quite ready yet when we were ready to announce the specification. So it almost, it, not almost, it did become its own little working group. So we may look at reincorporating that information once that specification information is, is up to standard, bringing that back into version three. Of course, we'll be looking at uh, additional extensions to the JSON uh, RPC API. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, stronger, more detailed requirements for public Ethereum compatibility. Again, uh, you know, we can't stress enough that uh, public Ethereum is always going to maintain as the core of enterprise Ethereum, so we really want to tighten that up. As Rob was saying, the, uh, the smart contract uh, permissioning and privacy uh, is an experimental section at the moment. Uh, not saying it will be non-experimental for version 3, but we'll certainly be making enhancements to that. And perhaps in subsequent versions of the specification, it will become a, uh, a normative section. Um, and uh, the last point there we have is to describe some of the performance metrics for uh, ready comparison. One of the things that we had in version one of the specification, we had some performance metrics. And to, to be honest, um, they weren't very well thought out. Yeah, because, you know, we were sort of thinking, oh, we have to have performance metrics, we have to have this in here. Um, and, but then people said, what? You know, how can you measure that? It's, you know, so for version two, we, we took them out basically. Uh, so version three, we'd be looking at putting them back in, but something that's a little bit more, um, a, a bit more realistic and a bit more measurable. Okay. So like I said, so Horatio. What kind of metrics are we talking about? Things like um, uh, transactions, a, a certain number of transactions per second, or um, how long does it take until a, um, a finality, for example, a transaction is involved? I, I expect the performance stuff to take a very long time to shake out because I know yeah. we looked at ahead of version one, and then there was you know, there was just chaos. The you know the, the so very different views, and it's very easy to come up with a simplistic approach which is meaningless. Um, you know, so if you're expecting you're going to have a network, you've got this new network latency between nodes, and you're going to, you know, you've got to have a very number of nodes. You know, so you can't just say, oh, we're going to have two nodes on a network on a LAN, because that on a, on a database it's got no transactions in it. That's meaningless. You know, you need to say, right, we've got one year's worth of transactions or ten years worth of transactions, and the nodes globally distributed, and etc. etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Large network. Anyway, Chris, take it away. I was going to say, what you were talking about here, my question is would the EEA provide some sort of test framework for this measurement of performance? Or yes. is this like just left up to them to choose how they want to measure and <laughs> yeah. select this stats? <laughs> to, to go with that, um, I would very strongly advise you to do something that I'm not going to say. Um, you can use the Oracle Sun model for Java, which is that come up with a equivalent of a EE certification, uh, the equivalent of a JCP <coughs> test, have a code available test that is owned by the uh, specification thing, is trademarked by yeah. the specification. Yeah. So you may not say that you are compatible unless you pass the test, and you may not use those. Yes, so yes. Be very, very strong in my work. And the same thing could be part of the metrics. Yes. Is that all? The, the, th the difference between, I would say, doing the way the Oracle Sun way and the way I did properly is make the tests available publicly. You don't have to go over on, you know, 
on your knees and say, please may I have the little mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right for me. Well, right right for me and here's two million dollars. Yeah, well, I think these days, assuming you could run your direct flight inside a Docker <coughs> container, it should be very doable because you could insert those network delays very easily between you know, an array that got Docker containers and you know, simulate the network. Um, I want to make this publicly available as part of yeah. the GitHub yeah. project yeah. and yeah. say, here, run this. This well, is what tells us whether you're certified or not. Yeah. An Ethereum Foundation and consensus. Uh, anyway, there, there is an organization, I'm not just worried about funding, but anyway, they're uh, actually working on a, um, a network simulator for blockchain systems. Okay. And I know we are working on our own one as well. And so you can imagine some combination of those things could be used as a basis for a test tool which then could be made publicly available, which then the EEA could say, could we please use this and brand it? Yeah, yeah. and the other part of that is having as an EPA, as an organization, have a legal mechanism to enforce whether or not you are, may advertise your compatibility or anything like that. Because frankly, if you don't, you get a lot of edge case of it's not the 8% that hurts, but the 2% it doesn't, well, it exhibits weird strange behavior. I saw that a lot in the organizations, and I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody. So, and just to answer your question directly, Chris, um, yes, that's so, certainly one of the things that we have discussed is actually putting together a test framework um, that allows you know everyone. It's just a level playing field so that everyone can um, test test their implementation and compare apples against apples. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking at um, Athon.consensus.net, which is the uh, RDF ontology for uh, Athon, but I haven't figured out in your presentation how um, the specifications have any relationship to RDF ontological um, ways in which to address them. So I can see in the, in the, in the consensus website mm -hmm. that there's a full ontology and um, the note before about folk is indeed marked down there. Yep. But in, in, you've got you know, different terminology and a range of different things so I haven't seen anything about RDF at all. So how, how is it that the two things work together? Are there resources that you might be able to point me to? Um, I'm not sure. I like In our little conversation just off, off camera before the presentation, yeah. um, we, haven't, um, we, we haven't had any sort of implementation of, of RDF within the specification um, right. at, this, at this stage. But it's not to say that you know that we won't be looking at it for you know subsequent versions. And could the thing that you're looking at, that could be some other spoke where the consensus. It, so yeah, it, it, I, yeah. I, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I've done some research and yeah. So we've got there are about 50 different organisations or you know within consensus, and mm. I guess we're part of one of them. Yeah. And so you know you've got a thousand, thousand five hundred people. It's hard to know that everyone's working on it in detail. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I get, I get, and quickly have you look, I have had a look and, and found that, um, that there has been participation with the DID, mm -hmm. decentralized identifier groups, yep. and, oh, and, and different things like that. Yep. So there certainly is work around RDF, but I haven't seen any of that referred to in the presentation today. Yeah. So I was trying to say whether or not there's actually any coupling there. No, 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 yeah. no coupling. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 That, that really sort of ties up for uh, plans for version 3. Um, if you're looking for more information, specifically about, for example, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the first link um, on the slide there, uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, if you're looking for the specification itself, that's the, the next point number 2, uh, spec.html. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance also has a series of other resources that you can look at. Um, I was referring to the um, uh, the trusted the off-chain co compute um, specification that's being worked on. I think it's um, version 0 .0, 0 0.5 or something at this stage, so it's not. But it's available if you want to go and have a look at it. It's on the resources page for the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So with that, that pretty much takes us to the end of the presentation. Any questions?
Any final questions? Because <laughs> we've had lots of questions I've so far. Um, I'm, and I'm <laughs> the ver verification chunk of the extensions. Um, yes. Is that explicitly going to include audit capability? In other words, is there, is there going to be an audit API that I can call? Or is audit sort of not? Because verification is not on it. It's, they're subtly different. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, I'm asking about audit. From an enterprise standpoint, that would be something that would be really important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, turn out the audit industry. Yeah. Well. There's, there's some preliminary um, enterprise interfaces of you know, outline from the specification, um, and so extracting uh, various types of information. Auditing is not specifically mentioned, but it um, certainly has that, that that can be expanded over time. That's that's essentially, that was my question. Is just, yeah. Have they figured out whether they want essentially auditing primitive to be part of the the verification, then you build an audit tool on top of it based on the implementation, or are we going to, or, or are you moving more in the direction of, you should have more sophisticated audit uh, ability, uh, audit certification <coughs> in the actual you know, version and things, and do that. You don't, here's, I guess here's the question. Uh, are you expecting the implementers to differentiate their products based on audit capability, or should everything be able to audit reasonably the same way? Yeah, I think it, the way it may go is that, um, Certain base number of uh, parameters or metrics need to be need to be made available to be compliant, mm -hmm. and other vendors may go beyond that. Um, that would be then exported if uh, if enabled and required and have to be used for, for um, those purposes of that enterprise. So it's a certain a point of differentiation. There's already there's already a big need of uh, exporting for metrics for data warehousing, system monitoring, performance monitoring, those sort of things. Uh, so that would be nice. Okay. So just to finish off very quickly then, just give you an, uh, an update as to future meetups that are happening. Um, in two weeks' time, Peter Robinson, Rob Dawson at the back there, uh, will be uh, presenting on the Pantheon Ethereum client and what it's all about. In the new year, February 6th, I'll be back. I'll be back. And I'm talking about the, uh, and I'll be giving a, a non-technical introduction to blockchain. So, and, and that's a bit of a lie, because you can't really talk about blockchain without trying to shoehorn in some technical stuff. But I will try and make it as uh, gentle as possible. Um, just and another quick note: these meetups will be held at the new WeWorks offices um, on. 310 Edward Street, on the corner of Edward and Anne. Yeah. Cross from Central. Yeah. Cross from Central Station. I think for is that, that, is that going to be level two? Um, ah, don't know. So the first two are going to be in their meetup space. Um, and so the first one is actually, so I'm going to introduce Consensus and Pegasus. And Rob Dawson um, is going to talk about Pantheon and Ram client. And so that's really introducing ourselves to the WeWork community, but also, you know, it'll be for those of you who haven't been watching all the media and everything, an introduction to Pantheon and what the people in group have been doing uh, with the Pegasus people. Um, and then the next talk, the one in February, I'm hoping that everyone will bring everyone they know, um, you know. Bring your mum. Bring, bring your mum. Bring, bring, <laughs> bring your grandma. You know, bring your kids. Bring everyone and say, look, this guy's going to tell you all about blockchain, and you're going to understand, and it's going to be fab. And uh, even if you can't be here, why don't you watch it on YouTube? Um, yeah, on the live stream. So oh, I mean, how's, I'm, how's that for me? Yeah, <laughs> no pressure. But no, no, I, I, I think it's going to. I think that one's going to be fab. But then after that, so we're just in the midst of sorting out the long-term plan um, for the next, the first half of next year. And um, that will probably be in a smaller venue, but within 310 Edward Street. And so we'll work that out when we get to it. Additionally, another interesting thing about next year is, so for those of you who've been coming along for a while, you will remember there were um, university people who came in and presented about a few different things. And so in it, we're going to continue that every six months. And I'm really intrigued to see how some of these people you know, evolve over time. Another thing we're going to do is once every six months, we're going to ask 
um, through organisations that are using blockchain in their businesses, in their you know, daily work, um, if they could, three companies could each do a 20 minute talk and um, you know, say, this is what we're using blockchain for, this is you know, what about how, this is what we do with a business, and this is what we're doing with it, and how it fits in. And I think that would be really interesting, that would be blockchain applications. So if you happen to be a company and uh, are using blockchain in your company, and you know, you you would be happy to you know, present 20 minutes with some other people, um, you know, have a 20 minute slot, then please contact me because I'm putting together the list of people at the moment that are probably be in something like April next year. Um, and to give you a bit of a time frame, maybe May, I don't know. Anyway, sorry, Grant, I've yeah, no. talked for a while there. Yeah, no, um, go for your life. That was absolutely, <laughs> so Rob and Grant, so thank you very much, that was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.